Let's talk about diversity, which most people would consider to be America's greatest strength. If you look at the numbers, I'd say I, I think about 15% of the American population, let's say nine to 15% uh, are immigrants. And you could argue that you've got immigrants from all over the world. And most people would agree that these immigrants, for the most part, have contributed you know, spectacularly to America's success. You can go back to German immigrants like Einstein, uh, other immigrants that were responsible for the Manhattan Project, which eventually won, helped win World War II. You can talk about just here in San Jose, you know, just all the, a lot of us on the east side, you know, the re rejuvenation of that neighborhood on the east side, which was once a very dangerous place, has occurred primarily because of the large Vietnamese population. So, but let's just take a little bit, let's take a closer look. We talked about this number like eight to 15% and so on and so forth, but it turns out that a lot of other countries have an, have an even higher percentage of immigrants. If you go to almost any small Arab country, you know, I, I, you, you'll see a lot more diversity. It's just that that diversity will be primarily from African and, you know, Pakistan or, you know, Middle Eastern, Eastern places, as opposed to just all over the world. And so you won't, you won't see, you know, very, I don't think I saw any Vietnamese people in uh, Dubai, uh, but of course you'll see Indians, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, lots of Africans. Um, you'll see a uh, po po Polish people. Um, you know, so you, you've got some diversity, but you could argue again, that it's not really worldwide in the sense that the United States has Puerto Ricans, it has, gosh, Cubans in Miami and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, you go to Qatar, right? Again, same, same situation, you know, at least more than 15% will be immigrants. If you go to Singapore, perhaps the most successful country in the world in the 21st century, about 20% of, the, of their population are expats. In other words, immigrants. So when you really look at the data, uh, it doesn't necessarily indicate that the United States is really number one in the world when it comes to immigrants. What the United States has really has been successful in doing in reality is taking a lot of the world's successful immigrants, especially the scientists, we talked about Einstein, and then leaving a lot of the other countries to deal with more blue collar immigrants. And, you know, so that's had consequences because most countries will, will probably want, you know, to make Einstein a citizen or to make, you know, if you just look at the long distance medals in, in the Olympics that the in long distance running, that the United States has won. A lot of those people were, were not born originally in the, in, the, in the United States. They became citizens. And you don't necessarily get that same, you know, situation elsewhere. You know, if you look at, the, if you look at say, the Chinese national swimming team, they're, of course, they're different in, in a sense, right? People from Sichuan are, are treated differently from, than people from other regions. Uh, they have different cultures just because China is such a massive, massive country. But you don't necessarily get the same visual evidence of diversity that you do in, in, the, in the United States. Now, you know, so the first thing you want to look at, right, is the reality of the United States, States of success has not been immigration per se. It's been capturing successful immigrants and then making those immigrants into citizens. And not just making those immigrants into citizens, but rendering their children born in the country into, into automatic citizens. And so, you know, I've been, let's say I was in Abu Dhabi and I met an Indian doctor, I spoke perfect English. And, you know, he didn't really seem like he wanted to stay there long term. A lot of the reasons for that is simply because a lot of other countries due to their small size, just like Singapore, are, are hesitant to make 
immigrants into citizens. But the United States is obviously much more vast than a lot of these other smaller countries. And as a result, can pursue a different policy. And that policy has been birthright citizenship, which is what allows the parents that come here to, as people say about the Sichuan population, to eat bitter, to basically tolerate a lot of hardship in order to secure long-term gains. That's what the parents who come here are doing. They're not coming here for freedom. They're not coming here for, you know, for the most part, just for anything else other than a job and the ability to feel part of a political structure that is stable and, and inclusive. So the narrative in the United States about immigration has been pursued in a, incorrectly, which has led to a backlash. And that's, so the one way we can fix that is by simply pointing out that we are vastly underpopulated compared to most, most places in, 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 the, in the world. You know, I'm in San Jose, California, and this is one of the top 15 largest cities in America, despite, despite the fact that it only has about a million people. If you compare this with China, this country with China, there are, gosh, you know, a million would be a town for China. If you just look at Guang, Guangdong, Guangzhou, uh, gosh, you know, there's just Hangzhou. Um, you just look at all the different, you know, not to mention, of course, Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, you know, you've got all these places that you know, have 10 million or more. Mexico City has about 10 to 15 million people, depending on how you define the metropolitan area. So the one thing that we should be able to agree on is that the fact that the United States is vastly underpopulated for its size. And as a result, is able to pursue a policy of citizenship that almost no one else can do. And that's been the reason for success. Now, the problem is that for the most part, the policy of diversity has been based on hypocrisy. The reason that we have a lot of Vietnamese immigrants here on the east side and their children is because of the Vietnam War. They were essentially refugees that had to come here because the United States lost the Vietnamese the Vietnam War. It's the same thing with Cubans in Miami. The United States attempted to overthrow the Cuban regime. They lost. And all of the and, and essentially all of the pro-American allies were deported to the United States, the people that were supplying them with weapons, training, and so on. And what you see with the Cuban example is just how the United States attempts to overthrow other countries. And in many ways, it's, it simply funds the criminal elements of that society. So it's true that a lot of the people in Miami fled an unjust, what they considered to be an unjust regime. And certainly the property confiscation, the camps in Cuba that occurred after Fidel Castro successfully defeated the CIA's attempt to, to oust him, certainly give you pause to the extent that anyone is considering Cuba to be this bastion of freedom or a model to follow in terms of a, of a true revolution, of a cultural revolution or any other kind of revolution. But you also have to understand that one of the reasons these revolutions are so bloody is because you have, in many cases, a foreign element funding criminal elements within that country in order to destabilize the country, in order to then justify coming in and saving that country through typically, you know, greater corporate investment that requires the defeated nation to take out debt in the stronger nation's currency. That's been the pattern for quite some time. So we look, when I say that the United States' policy of diversity has been based on hypocrisy, it's not just Cuba, it's not just Vietnam. We look at a lot of the immigrants who've come here from south of the border. Well, you have to remember what you've got, we have a Catholic president 
what religion are the people south of the border? And when you understand that Catholic Spain colonized everything south of probably, you know, Louisiana, including, you know, at one point, you know, the, the possibly the entire, much of the West Coast, you can see that what the United States is really doing is you have is a situation where they're favoring immigrants that would be useful to one political party and the status quo. In other words, they're not necessarily taking in people who are truly diverse. They're taking in people who are part of the religious establishment in this country and who, quite frankly, are part of the history of this country if you want to consider colonization. And you can see how that would benefit the prevailing party and how that policy of immigration specifically would strengthen that party. So you're not, so again, you've got a policy that necessar isn't necessarily based on, you know, what the advertising tells you it's based on. It's not based on compassion. It's not based on anything other than self-interest at the, at the end of the day. And if you can imagine that, you know, why are so many people coming crossing the border illegally to apply for asylum in the United States? If you consider the fact that a lot of churches, you know, in Mexico and below, have legal contacts or legal systems that are similar to America's legal system, you can see how, you know, and, and work with legal organizations within the United States, you can see how there is once again an opportunity for the elites in this country to receive business in interpreting the laws that are the direct result of a, a Catholic style common law system. Well, not, well, just a common, just a Catholic style system. That's why we have so many Latin words within the law, you know, corpus, and so on and so forth, you know, mens rea, etc. That comes from a legacy of colonization from the Catholics. Now, this is interesting because, you know, we talked about Vietnam. Vietnam was an attempt by the Catholic Church and the American government to separate South Vietnam from North Vietnam and to make South Vietnam a Catholic American bastion or base. And again, that failed, but even though it failed, a lot of American businesses are still able to do business successfully in South Vietnam. So there is a strategy there that is successful. And the, and the, and one of the reasons it's successful is because of a strategy, a global strategy of the Catholic Church. If you think about the business, businesses of the Catholic Church, you know, all of them are, almost all of them, receive a tax exemption while at the same time receiving government funding. And that would include hospitals, that would include private schools, uh, from elementary all the way to law schools. The hospitals, you've got, you know, schools, you know, you've got an entire industry all over the world that, if not handled properly, can be put into a position where the these entities can compete against the government itself that's giving them the money to operate programs for the poor, whether that's Medicaid you know, or whatever, any sort of welfare program that's in, that's in existence. And so you can see how this might be a problem in many places and how it would also form the foundation of a secession plan. So in other words, if a government is not doing its job, you can make an argument that having competition in schools is a good thing. Because you want to have options if your government is not doing well. The problem is that the, if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, the history of the Catholic Church indicates that their strategy is of, of expansion is oftentimes based on a kind of nepotism that seeks to supplant existing governments that operate for everyone. And you can see that in San Jose, right? First of all, San Jose, what, what, what language is that? It's Spanish, Catholic Spain. Over here, I've said this before, 
the, in 2020, the police chief went to a private Catholic school that now costs, I believe, $30,000 a year to attend. Uh, the mayor uh, went to a private Catholic school. When the mayor ran for election, he ran against somebody who went to the same private Catholic school. Not, not, not the same class, but the same school. Police chief, mayor, you've got the governor of California, Catholic. You've got the supervising judge, Santa Clara County, that went to a Catholic law school. So you look at this and you understand how the fragmentation within the United States created a lot of antipathy towards the Catholic Church within this country. None of the founders of this country were Catholic. The KKK in some countries, uh, sorry, in some states like Iowa, was originally anti-Catholic because of immigration and a lot of other issues. But if you look at the history, there's no question that this strategy has been, has been successful. It's led to immigration from all over the world. So let's, let's take a situation like Jeff Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos' stepfather was part of a, a group that came out of Cuba uh, that was assisted by Catholic charities. So if you look at, again, this idea that these charitable programs that receive government funding as well as a government tax break are in a superior position to provide services because of a global network, you can see how, you know, it's not only, you know, criminals that are funded, obviously innocent people get caught up in the entire system. And unfortunately, bystanders exist not only in drive-bys, but in political upheavals. And so we have Amazon here today in this country because of Catholic charities. But you have to also understand how that came about. It came, came about because a lot of the charitable organizations in this country are set up to take in refugees that are the result of a failed attempt overseas to oust an existing government. And when that fails, suddenly we have little Vietnam, a little Saigon, East in my city, Miami becomes a stronghold for Cubans fleeing Cuba. And you go back and you look at all these issues and the pattern exists obviously in Europe. Czechoslovakia is now Czechia and Slovakia because the Catholics wanted their own place in Slovakia. You look at South Sudan and Sudan, what is that again? The idea of taking over, using a strategy worldwide to secede from everywhere else in a way that allows you to be more successful than competition because you're tied into a global network. So you've got media connections, you've got political connections all over the world that provide necessary services like hospitals and schools, but that provide these services in ways that potentially supplant local governments that aren't careful. Now, why, why might that be? So, you know, if you think about it, right, if the government is, why would the government outsource or in its essential functions, such as welfare? One reason has always been that smaller organizations are more efficient and are more pro, can be more proactive. So if you have a expertise in building hospitals and schools, it's very difficult for a government especially an inexperienced one, especially one that was put in debt after World War II to say no. And you can see how, you know, you've got a situation where suddenly the people who are operating these institutions can, even though they are dependent on governments to fund them and give them tax breaks, you can see oftentimes, you can see how governments could be held hostage by those same organizations if those organizations threaten to simply stop working unless their demands are met. So once you have a, a sufficient core of expertise within another country, you know, it's not as if the government can step in overnight and suddenly, you know, transfer whoever is being helped by these private schools or by these private hospitals or by these competing hospitals. They can't do that overnight. They can't build a hospital overnight. 
they can't go to school overnight and get it running. And if you think about just how little time, you know, parents have, uh, or just how essential emergency services are, you can see how this initial objective of helping people in foreign countries can be t t manipulated in a way that renders foreign governments dependent on a globalized system that doesn't necessarily look out for their best interests. And you see that here, you know, you've got a lot of people in this country, right, who are simply, you know, once you supplant, once you create enough of a power structure that runs parallel to the public power structure, you can see, especially in essential services, you can see why the government in America has lost so much credibility because it's now just become sort of this, you know, paper pusher. I used to, I, I complained that as a lawyer when I was actively practicing law, that it was just a paper pushing job. It wasn't really, you were just sort of a cog in the machine, even though you were part of the elite in a sense. And it wasn't until later on that I was able to put all the pieces together. But of course, you can see right away that having the system in place is, and having the effects of these systems in place are partly the reason, uh, partly because of the fact that the World War II did not end in 1945. The Dutch were still occupying in Indonesia in 1950, I believe. They were holding hostage the future Indonesian president in Jogja, in Jogjakarta. So the, what people want, to, what you're taught in school is that magically, you know, the Russians, well, they're not, they're not even taught the Russians went, went into Berlin, but the Russians went into Berlin and in 1945 and magically, you know, so these, you know, magically World War II was over. Not true. These systems were still, people were still fighting all over the world for, to maintain their property interests all over the world. So it's not a coincidence that now there's a war after World War II, there's a war in Cuba that leads to the confiscation of property, that there's a revolution in China that leads to the confiscation of property. All of that was a backlash against foreign interests that had attempted to supplant the government and replace it with a structure that was more loyal to a globalized network as opposed to a domestic network. And we talked about diversity being a facade in America. You know, we don't really have any Chinese people in this country you know, that were born in China. Um, they're actually from Taiwan. I can't think of any Chinese CEOs in the entire... I, I know Vietnamese CEOs, obviously Taiwanese CEOs. The ta Taiwan was involved in chip fabrication, making chips, uh, semiconductor chips, and, and still continues to be involved. So, you know, you, you can see how this policy of diversity does not maximize diplomacy. Because if you don't actually have a sincere policy of immigration in, in the sense that you believe in true diversity, in the sense that you want to learn from all, all the cultures all, all over the world, and you're lucky enough to be in a country that has a legal policy of citizenship, plus the land, plus the wealth, in order to actually pursue a policy of true diversity, if you're lucky to be in that position, but you're not doing anything about it, why wouldn't there be a backlash? And why wouldn't the potential of the country go to waste? So, you know, we don't really have Asian diversity here. If you want Asian diversity, you have to go to Singapore. And the easiest way to figure these things out, by the way, is food. You know, if you go down and, you know, that's one of the reasons Anthony Bourdain was just such a, such an interesting, decent man, just because he was able to sort of secondhand learn about all these different cultures just by knowing the ingredients, just by being a master chef. And you can see by the way in the United States why we're having problems with China. Now, I am in the United States right now, but I was born in Iran. So where did my family go? Where, where were they when there was a revolution in Iran in 1979? They were in the United Kingdom, along with me. 
They weren't in the United States. Now, who was, which country was attempting to, I'm not going to say steal, but gain access to Iranian oil and natural gas under unfair terms? It was the United Kingdom, the Anglo-Iranian oil company. It wasn't the United States, at least not initially. And so it wasn't a coincidence that we were not, we went to England first or Scotland first before coming to the United States, which took over the security role of the British Empire after World War II. So you see once again that the even I am here not because of any sort of compassion. I'm here because the Western empires were trying to gain access to natural resources. And that's been the policy of immigration in this country. That's been the refugee policy in this country. It's been an insincere policy of essentially using immigrants to mask a scramble for resources all over the world, both land, oil, and natural gas. And because that policy has been insincere, the country has become divided. It's no longer, and, and justifiably so, especially because we're in a position where we can pursue alternative or means of diversity in ways that continue to differentiate us from the former Soviet Union, from competing superpowers today like Russia and China and Japan. And by the way, the Russians are taking in a lot of affluent Pakistanis. So it's not as if other countries haven't sort of figured out that immigration is a useful tool in the propaganda network. But if it's not sincere, if it's done in a way that attempts to cover up true intentions, if it's not sincere, then what you end up having is a divided country politically. And what's most important when you deal with any sort of country, any sort of institution, is sincerity. If you are sincere, people, whether citizens or non-citizens, they will continue to listen to you. It's something fundam fundamental about human nature. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world to be listened to. You don't even have to be the nicest person in the world to be listened to. All you have to do to have credibility is to be sincere and have a high work ethic. And Malcolm X, of course, is famous for his quote, I'm not an educated man, but I am sincere, and my sincerity is my credentials. He knew human nature so well. And that's also one of the reasons I love freestyle wrestling, Olympic freestyle wrestling, is simply because a lot of the people who have built the sport have exactly those two things, sincerity and work ethic. Dan Gable in particular. Now, Dan Gable was not the best technician. That was Bobby Douglas and probably Zeke Jones out of Arizona State and probably even John Smith out of Oklahoma State. And you look at why Dan Gable is perhaps better known across the country and across the world. He, he was the one that had a, a deal with the Japanese shoe company, ASICS. And you look at that and you see the fact that when someone is sincere and has a strong work ethic and makes that the foundation of his character, that's what counts. That's what matters in the end. So whatever Dan Gable says, no one will dispute him. They will, no one will, he, he's liked by everyone. Despite the fact that he's, you know, Iowa has, you know, it's not, it's not the most diverse program. Now that's Oklahoma State, historically, under John Smith. Um, you know, again, not the, not, the, not the smartest wrestler, right? Not the best tactician, not, not the one with the best technique, but people are drawn to him because the foundation of those two things, sincerity and work ethic, typically lead to integrity. And people seem to intuitively recognize that in one another when they see it. 
And if you look at the United States, you look at what you have to do, or any country has to do, has to do to, to move forward. It's basically to, to take the values on of Dan Gable, of the of the, the Olympic wrestling community as a whole. And you know, I mentioned three coaches that are well known not just for you know their work ethic and their sincerity, but also their sense of fairness. Zeke Jones cautioned one of his own wrestlers. Um, who, you know, was using illegal tactics. Um, you know, no one's ever, I've never seen anybody from Oklahoma State, uh, you know, engage in, you know, unfair tactics. You can't say the same thing about a lot of other countries. You can't say the same thing about a lot of, a lot of other superpowers. And that's what really, in the end, in addition to the citizenship path that we have in the Constitution, that's really what makes the foundation of this country so attractive and worthy of being listened to. And if you have in this case a power structure that is based on debt, that is based on immigration as a recovery tool for military expansion, it's not going to work in the long term. It can't work in the long term because the foundation is not based on sincerity. sincerity. And that, I think, is what makes me so sad that within the United States, you have all these different pockets of sincerity and work ethic. And, you know, of course, the Protestants were, you know, the culture emphasized work ethic. And, and the reason for that might have been because they were protesting the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, of course, depended, depended extensively on slavery in order, in order to expand its real estate, its schools, and so on by, by essentially shipping cotton, sugar, um, and tobacco, you know, to Europe. You know, when this country was first founded, you know, you have to realize that a lot of the problems we have here today, you know, it's not just that a lot of our, uh, a lot of our immigration is based on failures overseas. It's the fact that because it's based on failures overseas, in part, when the immigrants come here, the policy has also been to add on segregation on top of that. Now, there's nothing wrong, you, know, you can imagine a society, ideally, where, you know, the government outsources hospitals and schools to a multitude of different, you know, different entities. So uh, there's nothing wrong with, it would, it would be ideal, in fact, to have a, a, a county with a, you know, hospital run under the aegis of a Buddhist, a school run under the aegis of a uh, synagogue and you know you know so on and so forth because of these sorts of because of these sorts of that's real diversity and the reason for that is you know, because you've divided the you know, these different entities into a structure that cannot coalesce into a concentration of power based on nepotism you're also able to you know essentially pursue a path that allows you to take the best from all those different agencies. So presumably the Buddhist you know, led hospital won't be using the same software as everyone else, right? They won't be necessarily, they might be more open to, you know, um, homeopathic techniques. Now, you know, we don't know if those will work, right? But you have to have data, right? So, you know, the software might be different. What works? What is more secure? The idea behind diversity has always been that people have strengths and weaknesses. And by coming together in a way that maximizes data and sincerity, uh, you know, we can try to take the best, essentially not just steal natural resources, but steal the best ideas from all over the world, not just the food. So far, we've been really successful in stealing recipes from all over the world, but not culture. And that's been, again, the result of a lack of sincerity. But you can imagine a society where you know, you have these different hospitals, these different educational systems that compete with the public sector and therefore give citizens and residents a, a, many options. And in doing so, in giving people these options, right, also allow at some point, at different intervals, the ability to cooperate together along with the government in order to create a system where the best people can, can exchange ideas and when what works and what doesn't work and work together to use the public purse for the betterment of all people within that country. That's what true diversity was meant to do. That's what all these different fragments were meant to do. They were not meant to isolate the problem of chattel slavery in ghettos 
and then compound those problems by taking in refugees that to the extent that we're not part of a black market network that was able to fund itself, it wasn't meant to segregate, to, to enhance segregation in a way that made it more difficult for people to cooperate and easier for a globalized structure to separate others in the same way that the Protestants, that the non-Catholic churches are separated and fragmented from each other in response to the Catholic Church's intolerance in Europe, wasn't meant to enhance that player's, a single player's ability to dominate essential services. And you can see again that there is a path forward if we want to value true diversity in a way that's based on the values of Dan Gable and the values of a lot of other wrestlers. And, you know, the, the Mormons, by the way, we're talking about religion, they have an advantage as well. If you look at Oklahoma State, the wrestling program, which is the most diverse, which has been the most diverse, um, Japanese wrestlers, I mean, everybody, right? Um, it's you know, run by, I believe, a Mormon. And, you know, you can see that the Mormons are a majority in Utah, in this country, a province of America, a state, but a minority almost everywhere else. And that majority minority status, I think, has a lot of advantages because you get to be an insider and an outsider, depending on where you are. But it also keeps you humble. It doesn't mean the best people are going to be elevated within the political structure. Nobody thinks Mitt Romney is the best woman out there. Um, I, I've called him the, the male version of Hillary Clinton. Uh, in other words, unlikable and not sincere, despite being highly intelligent and having a wonderful team. It's simply just this idea that when you have true diversity, you're trying to put your best face, your best people forward so that you can cooperate in a way that brings, that essentially functions as a form of diplomacy, a form of everyday diplomacy. And if you segregate, if you have a history of chattel slavery that persists to this day, based on events that occurred 400 years ago, that have wrapped their tentacles into the soil and make it difficult for true diversity to actually exist. You have to be able to understand that's not optimal. It will create further division. A crack in a piece of glass oftentimes leads to another, to more cracks, unless it's fixed. And what we need to do in this country is first of all, understand the history, understand that a lot of our problems are fixable all over the world. And also that almost all of our solutions have been short term because they've been looking at history from a short term perspective. If we're still having problems here regarding racial race, race issues and segregation based on events that happened 400 years ago, you can only imagine that the whole world hasn't yet recovered from World War II, even though we've been taught that World War II ended in 1945. It hasn't yet recovered from all the revolutions from all over the world since 1950. It's still struggling 70 years later to try to, to try to fix all the problems that occurred. It led to not just one war, but two wars, right? And if we haven't been able to fix the problems since from 70 years ago, we should be a little bit more humble about a lot of the other social issues in this country and you know, all over the world in a way that hopefully nudges us towards greater, greater diplomacy and a country that's based that maximizes the values that someone like Dan Gable stands for as well as Malcolm X.